Welcome to the introduction to a series of videos from Chapter 7 on trusses. We're going to begin this process by focusing on analysis, which means we're going to pick apart the structure into its individual components and perform various analyses to understand what the role of each of those components is within the overall action of the system. So we're going to begin with Chapter 7, Section 1, Subsection 1, which is titled Systems of Two-Force Members. And in the process of this video, we're going to demonstrate that the actions of the individual members or struts that make up this truss network are either in axial tension or axial compression. And in the process, we're going to lay the foundation for some very elegant structural analysis that will tell us what the internal forces are within the truss. This would be an example. This is a six bay, square bay, parallel cord truss. So the top cord here is horizontal, the bottom cord is horizontal, and they are, of course, parallel to each other, hence the name parallel cord truss. Um, most of the trusses that we make are parallel cord trusses because they're very easy to fabricate. We will learn later on that they are not necessarily, in certain circumstances, the most efficient truss geometry, but trusses in general are so efficient and parallel cord trusses are easy to fabricate, so that becomes our most common configuration. <clears throat> this particular truss is shown with a uniform load uh, across the top, which would be uh, load W in pounds per foot or kips per foot. And we designate that with a series of arrows and put a continuous line on them to denote that those are actually not discrete arrows or point forces, but are in fact a continuum distribution of force. Um, <clears throat> in longhand problems, we typically draw arrows like this, but that tends to consume a fair amount of time, and in computers we typically don't even do that. We'll designate a load in this way, <clears throat> so each one of these lines is to be read as a force, and this line connecting them all together is to is a graphic representation of the fact that that's to be read as a continuum of force. Um, in such graphic techniques, we typically draw this flag with these lines above this cord when the intention is that the force is going down or in that direction. So this would be a gravity load. And if we wanted to show a wind suction, we would show it in this manner where the flags with these lines are down below, suggesting that there is a force upward. And this is actually fairly realistic because if we have wind suction on the top, um, that's not really a force. <clears throat> what we mean is that the air pressure inside or on the lower side of the decking that's on this truss um, is higher than the pressure above and so in reality we do have a force pushing upward on the decking. For the moment though let's uh, limit ourselves to gravity forces and we will render them in the following manner. In this truss these joints are designated with a circle where all the members are connected together uh, we sometimes refer to those as joints, sometimes they're called panel points, and sometimes they're called vertices. The term vertex tends to be more commonly used when we work on things like network domes or geodesic domes or even space frames, but the term vertices to describe these kinds of uh, connections of struts is a very common terminology. and for all intents and purposes, the word joint, vertex, and panel point are interchangeable, and I will sometimes uh, flip-flop back and forth between them, 
So you should be aware that they all mean the same thing. Now, in this case, we've shown a uniform load on the top cord of this truss. And that would be probably the most common way of loading a truss in the modern day. Um, so this could be a parallel cord truss that's pre-manufactured. There could be corrugated decking resting on the top cords, which are causing this distributed load. That decking would be welded down or nailed down to the top flange to the top cord of the truss. Um, in a lot of early truss design for uh, train bridges and vehicular bridges of various kinds, where these members are fairly long and the spans involved are fairly long, uh, they might have run beams from this vertex to the corresponding vertex on the next truss over. Um, then the decking, instead of running perpendicular to the truss as we see it here, the corrugated decking would run in this direction and would deliver its loads to the beams running between the trusses, and those beams would create point loads on the vertices. Either one of those loading conditions can occur depending on how uh, it's decided to frame out the building. In our case, though, we're going to start off looking at this situation where we have a uniform load W along the top cord uh, because it's so common. And one of the immediate things that should jump out to you is that if we've got forces perpendicular to these members, then the top cord is in bending. It's not in pure axial compression or axial tension. It has bending in it due to the local effects of this force. Now, that represents a complication in terms of understanding how this top cord is going to behave. But in fact, it's not a huge complication because we're going to learn that we can separate out the bending phenomenon that's going on in those top cord members from the role of the top cord members as part of the overall spanning action of this truss. So under the loading conditions we see here, we intuitively know we're going to have compression in these top cord members, but we know we also have bending associated with this uh, force distribution perpendicular to the member's axial direction. So we need to talk about all the things that are going on in these top cord members in order to pick it apart and analyze it and understand what's happening. So let's pull out one of those members and note that there are three possible kinds of actions going on. Here we've shown the member, and at each end we've indicated that there could be a moment there. That moment will definitely exist if the top cord is a continuous member, and in most trusses that are less than 60 or 80 feet long, uh, the top cord is designed as a continuous member. It's more economical to use a single member, uh, even though that may be structurally less efficient in certain places uh, because the force in the top cord is not uniform. Um, but it's much easier to put some extra material into the top cord than to uh, design a bunch of complicated joints to allow us to vary the cross-section of the members. So we'll have continuous members across the top. In other words, that will be a single member which is put in bending by all these, uh, uh, all this distributed load W. And we already know by now that that means we're going to have negative moments in the top cord over the supports and positive moments out somewhere around mid-span and then neg negative over the next. So when we look at this, we say, well, at the ends, the, the moment is actually going to be in the opposite direction. And that's, it's fine to make that point mentally, but here I've just drawn it with the arbitrary choice of saying we're going to draw it as if it's a positive moment, and when we solve for it, if it comes out negative, we'll understand what the implications of that are. So we can have some moments at the end, um, and those moments, by the way, 
uh, typically are not going to be very large, and we'll discover that later on when we go through some really detailed analysis. And it turns out that you can pretty well ignore them and assume that you have pin joints everywhere in your truss. And the analysis that you go through makes like a 1% error in doing that. But we will want to demonstrate that before we're done rather than just presume that that's the case. So the moments typically are fairly small, uh, at least uh, relative to the overall uh, effect on the truss. And in our analysis, we can uh, treat them as if they're zero moment and get pretty good indicators of all the axial forces that are occurring everywhere in the truss. In addition to these moments, you could have a point force at each end. And for the moment, I've drawn it really in arbitrary directions. So we have a force P1 and P2. And then in addition to that, we have our load W, uh, which is uniformly distributed along the member. And there will be some reactions there of the joints that are basically supporting that top cord. Um, so what I'd like to do right now is, first of all, um, we're going to say, take on faith for the moment that these moments are small and we're going to ignore them. So our, our system of forces boils down to these two things. And furthermore, I want to take this part out and analyze it separately for a moment. So here we have the uniform load W on the top cord. There's a vertex here and a vertex there. And for the moment, I've separated the vertexes out. So I put them down here because I want to look at what's happening to the member, and then I want to look at what's happening to the vertices. So when I look at this member, it has a total load W times whatever the spacing of the vertices is. That's the net gravity force down. And each of these reactions has to be equal to half of that in order to assure the equilibrium under that particular force. So this reaction is WS over 2. And this reaction is WS over 2. And I'm going to further simplify our nomenclature by saying uh, WS is in the units of a force because it's pounds per foot times feet, uh, which leaves something in, in units of force, which is what we expect for a reaction. And we're going to just say, by definition, WS is equal to P. So WS over 2 is equal to P over 2, and that's the upward reaction at the end of this member. Now, that reaction is being supplied by the vertex. The member connects to the vertex. If the vertex can't support it, then the member would begin to plummet downward. Um, the vertex is what's providing this upward force, and by action-reaction pairs, if the vertex is pushing up on the end of the member with a force P over 2, then the member must be pushing down on the vertex with a force P over 2. And the same thing is happening to the vertex that's supporting the right end of the member. So what this says is every segment of top cord delivers a P over 2 force to the vertex at its right end and a P over 2 force to the vertex at its left end. So if we had another segment over here, then we'd have two of these P over 2 forces delivered to this vertex, one from the member on this side and one from the member on that side. So in other words, the forces on the vertices, or interior vertices, will be 2 times P over 2, or in other words, P downward. So we could draw a picture of that, and it looks like this. All the interior vertices have a half P force from this member, a half P force from that. So we have a 1 P force on all the interior vertices of the top cord. But at the end here, we only have a P over 2 force, which is associated with this member. There's no member on the other side to create a force. So this is a very common pattern you're going to see. 0.5 P force at the two end vertices, a 1 P force at all the interior vertices. And remember that the force P is W times S, where W is a uniformly distributed load in pounds per foot or kips per foot, and S is the spacing between the vertices. 
Now, it turns out that we can analyze this truss in terms of pure axial tension and compression. And then when we want to go uh, account for all the things that are going on in these top chords, what we do is we go back and we analyze the bending phenomenon in this member. And then from the overall truss action, we find out how much compression is in here. And then we have to size this member to handle both of those things going on at the same time. But for right now, we're going to focus our attention on just trying to understand how this truss behaves in terms of distributing forces through the members to get all of those forces to the end supports. I'll make one other comment. Um, in, in the load section, we talked about having applied loads and then the dead load of the decking and then estimating the dead load of the truss and throwing it up on top. So we showed all those forces being absorbed by the top cord. Um, the top cord, it turns out, is the only member that has any appreciable bending in it, but it has bending from all these influences, which can be very substantial. In addition to that, there is bending in every single non-vertical member, such as these diagonals, or in the cords themselves due to their own self-weight. However, the self-weight of a truss is typically less than 5% of what it supports, and the self-weight of these fairly minor members is very small, so in fact we typically ignore any bending stress in our analysis. So in other words, we'll go back to this truss and we'll assume these point forces are the only forces of any significance, other than eventually we have to account for the bending stress from everything piled on top of the truss. But we will ignore the bending stress associated with these kinds of self-weight issues. These effects can and are accounted for in a multi-frame analysis or some kind of structural analysis program but um, they're generally fairly minor. Okay, so let's go look at this. This is our, our classic point load on the joints uh, rendering of the truss, and we're going to start asking uh, more detailed questions about what's going on. So we've already said in a member within this truss, there are forces on each end. And we've drawn them here in a fairly arbitrary way, P1 and P2. We know that these two forces have to equilibrate each other um, because we've accounted for every other issue here in terms of um, the effects on this top cord member. So we know those two forces have to be equal and opposite. So we've rotated P2 around so that it's parallel to P1, and we put a minus sign on it indicating that it's in the opposite direction. This is still not an equilibrium, though, because these forces would tend to rotate it. The only way we can reduce the moment of these two forces to zero is to make them collinear so that their lever arm is zero, and that can only occur if the two forces which are exerted on the ends lie along the axial line of the member and they can either be in tension or compression. So this is a very powerful statement about trusses in terms of their analysis because the members now become unbelievably simple. When we analyze this truss, we only assume there's either tension or compression in the members and we step through uh, the truss in order to size it. Now, we're going to use something called the method of joints, where we skip from joint to joint, um, assuring equilibrium of the joints, and then the members become simple pass-through members because they all have this property that whatever forces are exerted on the two ends have to be along the axial line of the member. So, the only important thing from the point of view of the member is to know that this force is equal in that and magnitude of that one, 
and opposite in direction. That ends our video on Chapter 7, Section 1, Subsection 1 on systems of two force members in which we have demonstrated that the actions of the members as part of the overall truss system are either pure axial tension or pure axial compression or where there does exist some bending force that bending force can be analyzed separately and subsequently combined with the axial force in order to properly size the members.